Hedge Witchcraft and the Art of Hedge Riding The Hedge Witch is a deliciously enigmatic figure. It conjures to mind the image of a, usually, a woman living on the edge of a village, brewing potions from herbs she gathered in the wilds, chanting magical spells over it as she stirs the cauldron or the cooking pot. Cats are gathered around her feet, or sleeping in nooks and niches around the home. It's a cozy, comfortable, yet simple space, filled with interesting items that have both magical and mundane uses. The smell of herbs and wood smoke lingers in the air, and the abode is both welcoming and mysterious at the same time. She's known to sing to the moon, to talk with the birds, to predict the weather and to have charms for every known ailment. She consults the fairies and nature spirits, and she can walk between the worlds. She is a wise woman, a cunning woman, a figure from out of myth and folklore. All of these ideas may indeed be true of a hedge witch today. I, for one, live on the edge of a village and collect herbs for my meanderings on the heath and in the forest. I have two cats and a fireplace where I scry in the flames on winter nights. I have herbs drying in my home, but they're in the airing cupboard, as that's the best place I've found for the task. I have several cauldrons, but I cook with copper and stainless steel pans. I do perform magical spells and sing to the moon. I listen to what the blackbirds and the hawks have to say on any given day, interpreting their calls and sounds after years of listening to them all around me. I can usually predict when a low front is coming, as my ears pop, my arthritis kicks in, and I sometimes get a headache. I have a pharmacy of herbs in an old Victorian cupboard to treat ailments of all kinds. I have met with the fairies, the fair folk, and talked with the spirits of the land all around me. I have walked between the worlds. I also write on a laptop, watch television, and teach belly dancing. I live a fairly normal life at least in my eyes, though others might think what I do is odd or, at the very least, different from most. I do enjoy the eclectic, the unusual, but I also enjoy the simple things, like going to the pubs with friends and having a good pint of beer or glass of wine. My home is a 1980s build of red brick with a large garden and situated on a quiet cul-de-sac. I used to live in a city, but had the opportunity to move to the country years ago and jumped at the chance. My life is a mix of modern living and discovering old lore, incorporating both into the everyday routine. My herbal pharmacy contains herbs gathered locally, as well as others bought online from organic retailers. I honor pagan gods and goddesses, the ancestors and more. I live a magical and mundane life at the same time, seeing no division between the two. And over the years, I've re-enchanted my life to reflect who I really am and what I really want to do in the world. The life of a hedge witch reflects that each and every day. So what is hedge witchcraft? Hedge witchcraft is often seen today as a solitary pursuit, crafting one's life in a magical way that reflects the talents and abilities of the practitioner. It also denotes someone who is knowledgeable in the country ways, from knowing weather patterns to herbalism and more. The term hedge witch was coined by the author Ray Beth in her book Hedge Witch, 
A Guide to Solitary Witchcraft, in 1992. She took the term hedge from hedge priest, one who preached from the hedgerow and who had no physical place for a congregation. A renegade, a solitary, a priest who didn't follow the rules. This still applies to many today, myself included. A hedge witch is a bit of an anarchist. She likes to work alone, and she works in her craft daily, honing her skills and always learning more. She may think differently from those around her. She may see spirits and talk with the ancestors. She may talk to plants or animals, and she certainly walks her talk. She takes full responsibility for everything that she does and chooses carefully. She reveres the natural world around her, but she may not necessarily view it as a religion or spirituality. Susan Shepherd, author of A Witch's Runes, describes a witch as thus. While Wicca and ritual witchcraft have the elements of a religion, being a witch does not. But the witch honors all of the spiritual traditions that have preceded her. She takes what works for her and makes use of its meanings. Most important, the witch always gives back. For the hedge witch, the path may simply be one of life's work, of a way of life that honors the cycles of nature around her, without needing the label of religion or spirituality attached. Then again, she might honor gods and goddesses as she pleases. But there is more to hedge witchcraft than to simply work the craft alone, imbued with no knowledge of the natural world around you, of the green and growing things, of the cycles of the seasons. Held deep within the tradition is the art of hedge riding, of walking between the worlds, of being able to find the liminal places and to traverse the paths that lead to a deeper wisdom and knowledge. The boundaries between this world and the other world are manifold. You only have to know where to look. Hedges, as liminal places, demarcating one place from another, from the homestead to the wilderness, where wonderful places that could be used are perfect for such an endeavor. To go through the hedge was to travel into another world, to follow the heart into the wilds and receive information to bring back into this world. It was to step outside of the known and into the unknown. Hedge riding goes back hundreds of years. The German word Hagasiza means hedge sitter. This is one who straddles the boundary of this world and the next, of time and space, the known and the unknown, the civilized and the wild. They could ride that boundary line into the other world to talk with the spirits and the fey folk, to bring healing and other information back to their community. Working with hedges and with trees has long been a part of magical traditions the world over. The hedge witch operates in a less formal way than some traditions, not so much in the role of a priest, but as in the role of a cunning man or cunning woman who cared for others in the community. The art of hedge writing can still be seen today in the traditional portrait of a witch riding her broom. It is a symbol of the world tree, the Axis Mundi, that so many religious and spiritual traditions the world over use in their cosmology. Through this world tree, we find the roads leading to the fairy realms, the realms of the ancestors, and the realms of the gods. The shamanic nature of hedge riding appeals to many within the tradition who are aware of the hedge riding nature of this path called hedge witchcraft. 
It's learning to access through journeys in the mind and spirit, as well as in the physical, information that can be useful in everyday life. It also re-enchants our world, allowing us to see the beauty that lies all around us, the magical and the wonderful, the awe-inspiring moments that transcend normal, mundane life. It can be viewed as a form of astral travel, where the consciousness of the hedge witch travels to the other world, but it can also be done on the physical as well, where we can use the real life hedge or other liminal markers to move beyond this realm and into another, with all due precaution and skill. In either aspect, it is an altered form of consciousness that helps us in the work. With this information gained or gleaned from the other world, we can then put it to good use in this world. We might brew up a potion or have a new recipe for a healing tea or tincture. We might be able to locate that lost item now that we've had a little guidance from the other world. We might be able to find out why we're repeating the same mistakes or what our local patch of land needs from us in order to be healthy and whole. The uses for hedge riding are limitless. That is not to say that it is a whim or whimsy that we travel between the worlds, for this is indeed serious work, and we are committed to doing it with all honor and integrity. When crossing the boundaries while hedge riding, we will often get glimpses into the other world, or even spend time there learning all that we can from beings which are both like us and yet not like us. I speak of the fair folk, otherwise known as fairies, those creatures of the other world who are so much a part of witchcraft here in the British Isles. It was long thought that a witch derived her powers from the fairies, and it is why it is so important in hedge riding that we establish a good relationship with these folk. To sum up, a hedge witch might indeed live a rural, magical life in the beautiful countryside, but also she or he might live in a city, working with the tides of humanity, society, nature and the other world in a very different flow of energy to that of the rural practitioner. The practices of hedge riding can be adapted for any lifestyle with a little imagination and creativity. Above all, it's there to re-enchant your life with wisdom and magic that will sing to your soul. Trees are magnificent teachers. They're so much larger than we are, both spiritually and physically. They remind us of what it means to live a life in service to the whole, to live a life filled with integration and harmony, sustainable and at peace. Trees teach us of communion and integration, both at the deep root levels of our soul and reaching out towards the heavens of our soul's awakening. They teach us of symmetry and asymmetry, of cooperation and anarchy. They are a legion of souls across this land, swaying in the wind, living their intention and benefiting all around them, simply by their very existence. There is no sense of I with a tree. Rather, it can instigate a better sense of you or we. In my work in both witchcraft and druidry, connecting and having a good relationship to the other world is central to my practice. For those of us working with the hedge, we may use the world tree in a shamanic sense to journey in the realms of this world and the other world, namely using the three worlds of the lower world, the middle world, and the upper world. There we can quest the Awen. We can seek inspiration and guidance from the ancestors, from totem animals, and from the divine. The hedge is a boundary between the worlds, between civilization and the wilderness, between the bottom of the garden and the farmer's field, 
between this world and the other world. The hedge is made up of trees, sacred to the druid, sacred to the witch, and integral to their work. We establish a close bond to a tree, a specific type of tree, or a location of trees, if we can. The world tree reaches deep into the earth, holds strong and fast in this world, and reaches high into the realms of potential and divinity. We can view it as the mighty oak tree, a tree that was and still is especially sacred to the Druids. An oak tree's roots reach as deep into the earth as its branches reach up and outwards into the sky. It is a symbol of balance and unity, combining the roots, trunk, and branches into a single entity that we can connect with in our own work. We travel down through the roots into the lower world to meet with the fair folk and the ancestors. We can travel through the trunk of this tree into the middle world to meet with our spirit guides and totem animals. We can move upwards into the branches of the world tree to connect with the gods and our own inner potential. This is only a generalization of what we can find in the three worlds. For there are gods dwelling in the lower and middle world too, and ancestors can be found in all three worlds, as well as spirit guides and totem animals. Let's now look at the lower world. This is the realm of the Shi, of the mound dwellers, of the Tilwith Taig, those who live in the hollow hills, the fair folk, the fairy. All of these are motifs in Celtic lore of the world of the fairy, and when working with the lower world, we can know them through their king, Gwynap Neath. The lower world, known as Anun or Anuvan, is the Celtic other world, accessed through traveling below the earth, into the ground, or into a mound or hill. Glastonbury Tor in Somerset, England, is often said to be the place where Gwynep Neath resides, deep within that legendary hollow hill. He rides out with a wild hunt every Samhain, and traverses the sky through the winter months. The realm of the fair folk and the abode of the ancestors is often seen as one and the same, or at very least closely connected in the lower world. Anun can be accessed through ancient burial tombs known as barrows, and Gwynap Neath is seen to be the lord of the dead when he is out on the wild hunt. This dual sovereignty of the fair folk and the ancestors is apparent. In some tales, the protagonist sees their dead relatives dining in the halls alongside the fair folk. It is sometimes seen as an in-between place, perhaps as a resting place for the soul before it continues on its travels. It is also the place where the cauldron of transformation can be found, warmed by the breath of nine maidens. We can see Gwynapneath as the guardian of the cauldron of Anun, the protector of the goddess deep within the earth. Her attendant priestesses keep her fire alive and serve her and the world. The lower world, or Anun, is not a dark and dreary place, but a place of wonder, much like our own world. It is sometimes said that there is no sun or moon in the realms of the other world, only an ethereal light that is neither daylight nor moonlight. The middle world is where we spend most of our time, where the everyday happens, Yet this is not the world of the mundane. It's only our perception that makes it so. When we open our eyes to the beauty and sacredness of the middle world, we see all that it has to offer. The middle world is also sometimes known as Abred in the Welsh tradition. The middle world is the mortal realm. This does not mean that immortal beings cannot enter, for those with the skill and courage can traverse all three realms, 
be they human, fey, god, or otherwise. This middle world requires our attention just as much as the other worlds, and just as much respect. Druidry is a tradition based in locality, as is witchcraft. Where we live is of utmost importance, for we are part of that ecosystem, amidst that of the wider world. We have to know and respect where we are, where we live first and foremost, for that is also the realm where we have the most influence. The middle world is also the world that influences us the most, so there is reciprocity, which is immediate in this relationship. We depend on the middle world for sustenance, for food, shelter, and more. Our impact upon this world impacts our very being. We must look deeply into all our relationships, whether that is with the bird, the bee, the stag, or our next door neighbor. We must work with honor and integrity if we wish to see that reflected back in the world around us. The upper world is a place of potential, our highest potential, as well as being associated with divinity. In Welsh it is known as Gwynfed, where form in its purest state exists. It is the place of the archetype, the greatest possibility. We can quest the Awen in the upper world, seeking wisdom and guidance from all manner of being. This is the dwelling place of our soul's truth, of our sovereign self. When we work beyond our own shadow aspects, those parts of our ego that keep us rooted in our fears and woundings, we can travel to the upper world in order to realize our fullest potential, fully in control, and reigning supreme in our own being. When we regard the upper world in relation to the lower and middle worlds, we see how they all fit together holistically. The lower world is where we can come face to face with our woundings and our shadow, where the root of certain behaviors lie. We can connect to ancestral woundings as well and seek out the source of pain in order to work with it, to bring it to consciousness. When the unconscious is made conscious, we can act with intention. No longer are we operating on a reactionary basis to everything, but instead we have a purpose and an honorable way to interact with the rest of the world based on personal responsibility. Coming face to face with the hidden aspects of our soul, of our behavior and the world around us, we can bring this knowledge with us back into the middle world where we can work with it in our daily lives. We can then travel to the upper world in spirit to gain the inspiration to help us in our journeys through life. That is not to say that our shadow aspects are bad or evil and that the lighter aspect is good. It's simply being aware of all aspects of our being, of all three worlds. It is in the journey to understand ourselves that we come to understand the world. And that journey does not stop with ourselves. For it's not a self-centered tradition if you're following any earth-based paganism. We take the knowledge that we have gained and integrate it with the world around us in order to better the world. It helps us to see beyond ourselves and work towards a wholeness with nature. I'll now present a rite or ritual that you can use to walk between the worlds. If you follow a particular tradition, then do feel free to adapt this to suit that tradition. You can call upon the gods, the ancestors, the elemental guardians, whoever you wish to protect you during this ritual. This ritual can be found in my book, The Hedge Druid's Craft, Walking Between the Worlds of Wicca, Witchcraft, and Druidry. If you can, begin your work by standing in or near a hedgerow itself, looking away from civilization. If this is not possible, you can create a hedgerow by standing between two plants. Many potted trees will do well indoors, so you can research their properties and see what kind would be suited to your work. 
Stand on your dominant leg, raising your non-dominant foot off the ground. If you're right-handed, then your dominant side is your right side, for example. Close your non-dominant eye, perhaps by placing your non-dominant hand over that eye. This is a very tricky pose to hold for long, and if you're in a public place, it can look rather odd. I use the yoga tree pose, as I find it similar to this ancient description of this druid pose used to travel between the worlds. One half of you is solid and grounded, while the other half is being suspended. If this is too difficult a pose to maintain for any period of time, you can just put your non-dominant foot forward to symbolize walking between the worlds. Or you can hold the more difficult pose for a few seconds before moving to the easier pose. Whatever pose you choose to use, hold it for a few moments until you feel a shift in consciousness, and then say these or similar words. I walk between the worlds by the blessings of nature, by the blessing of the green and growing things, by the blessing of the wild creatures, by the blessing of the fair folk. I walk the path of the hedge druid, of the hedge witch. May the wisdom of the other world be open to me. May I take my guidance from all the realms around me. In safety and surety, I travel between the worlds to speak in the language of bird and beast, of plant and rock, of sun and moon and stars. Turn anti-clockwise three times, and then state, By the power of three times three, this is my will, so may it be. Take a moment to adjust, and know that wherever you go, whether you choose to move from this space or not, you are now also in the other world. Here, you can receive guidance from plants and animals, from nature spirits and the fair folk, from gods and goddesses of the wild wood and more. Journey where you wish to go. This can either be done in the physical realm, actually walking across heathland or meadow or through a forest or down the beach. Know that you are straddling the worlds as you walk and that what you see and come across may have a very different meaning than in ordinary reality. Or you can simply sit where you've begun the right and journey in your mind to a place where you wish to travel to gain wisdom from the plants and animals, the ancestors and other guides you may meet. Start slowly and gently becoming used to being between the worlds. It's not something to be rushed, but to be savored. When you have finished, return back to the place where you began and assume the original posture once again, this time facing towards civilization. Say these or similar words. I return from walking between the worlds in harmony and in peace, I return. May my powers be strengthened. May I receive protection in all my endeavors as I work towards balance and harmony with the whole. May I be the Awen. May I be inspiration. Turn clockwise three times and state, by the power of three times three, this is my will, so may it be. Take a moment to settle back into this world. If you can, eat and drink something to ground you in the present moment. You might clap your hands three times or pat the earth three times to signal your full return. You can also say your name aloud three times. Journal your experience as soon as you are able. This beginner's rite can be performed each time you begin your work in walking between the worlds, in hedge riding. 
You might do this before you go out to collect plants for your work, or to search for guidance from animal companions, or to use the weather to predict future events. It helps you to bring magic back into your life, to re-enchant the soul. When simple actions are performed when one is between the worlds, the power is increased and the work which we do sings out in a chorus of harmony across the web of all existence. I hope that this presentation has given you a good introduction to hedge riding and working in a hedge tradition, whether it's as a hedge witch or as a hedge druid. Working with the liminal, with those places between places, is truly a magical adventure that can re-enchant our lives and help us in our practice. Blessings on your journeys through the hedge.